with uh, labor market issues and industrial relations. And so I'm very glad to be here today and also thanks for inviting us and me uh, to introduce also this very interesting presentation by Charlotte Castell, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Stockholm and also deputy head of the Department of Sociology at the University of Stockholm and a researcher at the Ratio Institute. And uh, she will, as I mean, she has already mentioned a bit, she will uh, deal with today a, long, a very long debated topic, but still in search of a sustainable solution, I mean, which is that of the difficulty uh, to balance, to strike a balance between the employment protection legislation and firm efficiency and, and competitiveness. So I will leave the floor to oh, thank you uh, so much. the presentation. All right, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I'm happy to see that there's some people who managed to get here despite of the strike. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll just go into my presentation since uh, Ilaria did such a nice job presenting who I am. Uh, so the topic for today is balancing what's good for the company and, and employment protection. Uh, and, and the subtitle is the complexity of employment protection law for smaller production companies. So already here you can tell I'm like focusing in on a, on a very specific aspect of, of um, this issue. Uh, it, the presentation is, is based on a paper that I've been collaborating with Linda Wildenstedt, who is a PhD, PhD in sociology, but we also had great help of Giorgio Sideras, who's a political science uh, master student who helped us during the interviews and everything else. So we're I make dues to sort of include them here. Uh, so the issue of balance is, is I think, a pretty good way to to describe uh, this employment protection because I think that we all agree that there should be some kind of job safety or, or protection from from sort of arbitrariness in the labor market uh, and employers at the same time want to maintain a competitive company and, and be free to sort of hire and fire employees at will. Uh, so there's a sort of basic tension here. I say that in the presentation here, it's a partly conflicting goals, but I because I think that one other aspect of this is, of course, that when you hire someone, you also build a relationship with someone. Uh, so even an employer gets to see that, oh, you know, Alberto is a person, I care for Alberto, he's a nice guy. So it's it's a little bit like, I also want an organization that's nice to employees because, you know, I'm a human being and, you know, my employees are, are, are also human beings. Uh, at the same time, of course, where employees want job safety, they also are part of the work organization. And sometimes, especially, I'll, I'll get to that in, in uh, reporting on my interviews, uh, you know, not everybody um, makes a good teammate. And so, you know, there are these, you know, conflicting goals, but they're also partly consensual. Um, and I think it's very important to, to remember both aspects of this uh, when you talk about the law. Anyway, what we can see is that the balance of these two goals very much depend on societal institutions. Uh, the laws that are made or the agreements that are struck, the norms that develop in society, and, and they make up sort of the, the rules of the game. Uh, and, and, you know, plenty of research has, has pointed out to us and, and tried to show and emphasize that these rules of the game have very important um, consequences for the success of nations, etc. cetera. Uh, I already mentioned that, that institutions can be laws. Uh, I'm gonna focus on a law today, but they can also be collective agreements, uh, agreements that are struck by the um, partners in the labor market, employers, organizations, unions, et cetera. Uh, but also in sociology, what, what is taken as an institution can also be part of, a, of, a, of an informal um, aspect of society, namely social norms that actually are part of what's taken for granted as, as you know, something that 
affect societies. So employment protection rules are important uh, and there's huge variations in how these, this institution about how to protect employees in the labor market is formulated. We can see here the, what OECD does is that they do create an index of employment protection rules based on you know, how, many, how hard it is, what, how you define an employment, et cetera, et cetera, if you're fine when you do things. So, you know, and in this, you can, you know, go all the way from Canada and the U.S. up to sort of the Scandinavian countries where Sweden, I made a pink circle around. It's pretty far. It has a pretty strict system of employment protection in place. Italy is the arrow pointing down and, and um, you have even stricter uh, rules of the game here. So, but the interesting thing is that there are um, international variation and of course researchers use this kind of international variation to study what the consequences of uh, employment protection law is when it comes to productivity and so on. Uh, so anyway, in, in short, I just want to say something about the Swedish legal system. Uh, it's called laws. Uh, in Swedish, it's Lagen om anstandingsskydd the law of employment protection. Uh, and, and basically what it says is that redundancies or firing someone has to be founded on an objective grounds. So when you, as an employer, want to tell Alberta, sorry mate, no luck anymore, you have to have some sort of reasons for doing that. You can't just be like, I didn't like your tie today, get out of my sight, you know, you're fired. So. And, and what is then considered objective reasons is two dimensions. You have work shortage when there is actually two less orders or the company isn't doing so good. And hence you need to you know, reduce your employee, empl the number of employees. Or you have personal reasons. And personal reasons is very, very not specified in the legislation. It basically says, you know, we'll let the courts decide but you know, there could be different variations on this. And the court has decided. Uh, and uh, you see some of the reasons where you can actually um, give someone notice in Sweden. It's for incompetence, it's misbehavior, cooperative difficulties, and, it's, and then you can go down the list. But these are sort of the major um, basics for saying that, okay, objective grounds. If someone is clearly incompetent in, in doing their job, you can give them notice. If someone misbehaves, you can give them notice. If someone has cooperative difficulties, you can give them notice, okay? And, and as you see here, these, what, what, what is incompetence and how you rule that is gonna turn out to be difficult, but anyway. When it comes to work shortage, uh, the, the uh, law situation is quite clear. Uh, it says when there's a situation of work shortage in the workplace, you need to make a seniority order. So who has been hired in this position first, second, third, fifth, sixth, etc. And then you go with the principal last in, first out. So if you're the most junior person in the firm, you are given notice first, okay? And if, if this junior person is actually, has a specific competence, it doesn't really matter because you can then go to the second uh, character of the law, which is that when there's a shortage, you need to find, you know, so if, if someone has been there longer, than the junior person, and the junior person has a specific skill. If you can retrain the older person or the more senior person, you need to do so within reasonable costs, okay? And that has come to be defined as six months of, of some sort of skill upgrade. Uh, so, so basically it's saying like, you, you, you can't just say the junior person is more competent than the senior person, you, you have to sort of like train the old person to take the junior person's job. So that is basically the, 
the gist of the Swedish legislation. Of course, now I'm a sociologist and not a lawyer, so this is simplified and, you know, everything, of course. Uh, but just so you understand a little bit of what's going on. Okay. Uh, so when we get down to it then, uh, as I think is true perhaps in most con countries, uh, this, is the, uh, in, the, this is one of the laws in the labor market that creates the most friction between unions and employer organizations. And Sweden is no exception here. Uh, and it's very much debated. Uh, right now it's on the table again because of the coalition between the social democrats and, and the liberal and um, yeah a little constellation there that's new in the political system and all of a sudden it's up on the table again as something that needs to be reformed and you know so this issue is really a hot button topic for the most time and so it's very much uh, debated in Sweden and and some even go as far as to say that this is one of the major threats to the Swedish model. Uh, the Swedish model is based on unions and employer organizations actually striking deals. And how this, this law is, is uh, used in the labor market and is, is creating all this friction between the unions and the employers is you know, one of the reasons that they couldn't make a new main agreement uh, when they tried to, uh, because they stumble upon this as where they stand so much, so far apart uh, in, in actually coming together and so on. So it's an important law uh, in this sense. There, of course, other people have done research on this. I'm not very much not the first person. And uh, some of the previous research <coughs> or most of it is done by economists, I would say. Um, and they've, I've, I've cited three different research overviews here um, by Kahoop in 2011, Schiedinger in 2008, and, and a recent one by a colleague of mine at Ratio, Eva Udinson Gord. They all go through the research of, of economists in relation to employment protection law, and they say strict employment protection dampens labor market productivity. It's like a consistent finding. Uh, it makes economists work, work worse. Firms are not, firms are losing in competitiveness when, when there's strict employment protection in place. Sociologists also have done some of this and, and they, they have another type of, of critique to employment protection, namely that it locks in employees. So employees who are not happy in the workplace don't want to leave because they have been there. So it's, a, it's basically like if you've been in a place, you're high on the, on the list of the rankings of employees, you don't want to leave because then you'll be the junior one. And if, if something goes wrong with the company, you're out. So that's another type of problem, uh, of course, related to the first. But then we have Swedish law scholars. And, and Swedish law scholars, of course, study court cases. They study the, how the law is written. And, and do analysis of that. And they say, well, loss is actually quite flexible when you look at it. So the Swedish law is, is, is not as rigid as OECD thinks, and they point to a very specific aspect of the Swedish labor law. And that is that if a company is covered by a collective agreement, you can negotiate deviations from the labor law. So you don't have to follow certain aspects of the law. And so they point to that and they say, you know, if you have a problem with the law, you talk to your union, you make your case, and you can change. Um, for instance, the last in first out principle can be abandoned, and you can strike different types of agreements, you know, with the other party. And that's a good case, of course. But basically, uh, our conclusion, or what we try to argue in the paper, is that this is really multifaceted research with some sort of conflicting conclusions. Um, we see that we can approach this uh, kind of from, from 
what we in sociology has a long tradition of calling unintended or unanticipated consequences. Of course, it's not new to sociologists only, but you know, I'm going to frame this in, in my fields uh, research tradition. So we have a law and that is implemented and supposed to have anticipated consequences, right? So you, you say laws wants to outlaw employers ability to fire at will in order to to establish job protection. We want to have a fair and, and sort of just labor market. So employers need to be li limited in, in firing at will. So that's the anticipated conquest. You, you want to get rid of this kind of behavior. But then, of course, in theory and practice, these are two different things. And you, you see in the previous research that, you know, the unanticipated consequences might be stuff like lower productivity or, or employee lock-in, right? So that wasn't really the intention of the legislator, but then you can argue, of course, you know, there's always consequences. And, and if we think that one consequence is important enough, maybe we are, you know, willing to overlook the unintended or unanticipated consequences. And so this, of course, is, is where we come in with the balance. You know, we need to strike a good balance here between uh, these two kind of goals. Okay, and so our contribution is really like looking into how the rules of the games are implemented locally. Uh, and, 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 and specifically, we try to do so in terms of balance of, of companies versus job protection. You know, how, how do this work in practice? Uh, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. And, and so I think this, this focus on local knowledge and experience is, is particularly pertinent in, in this case, since you can renegotiate aspects of the law, right? So actually talking to companies uh, is, is very sort of inherently interesting, I think. That's my third motivation. And that's actually how it started, because I was like, how does it work? Uh, but theoretically, you know, it's kind of interesting to learn more about how local unions and employers negotiate this kind of law that's semi-optional. You know, you can choose to go by the law or you can sidebar it. You can make your own agreement with the union. From an institutional perspective, I have never heard or seen anything written about this kind of semi-coercive law. Um, you know, a law that can actually like be reworked or, or translated and manipulated locally. And, in, and you know, within, within the law, I'm sure there's all kinds of law disrespect locally in the labor market. But I mean, the, in this case, it's actually like we can, we can sort of um, break the law if you want, and that is perfectly fine, right? Because we have a collective agreement. So this is what we tried to do. We were setting out to look at employment protection law for local business uh, and make interviews with managers. And not just any managers, we were specifically identifying managers that had recent experience with redundancies of all sorts. Because we really didn't want just to talk to managers and hear them bashing the law and how bad it is and everything. We wanted them to tell us like, okay, what happened? What did you do first? And then what happened? So how many times did you negotiate with your union representative? Three times, okay. And are you happy with the result of the negotiation? What, what was the result? How many months of extra pay did you have to? sign up to, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted really concrete cases where employers had practical experience of, of actually working with the law, which made it quite challenging to find people. Anyway, so what we were interested in, in learning more about basically was what does it mean to lead and organize a competitive business and also comply with labor, uh, labor employment protection? Uh, and how do they think of the legitimacy of employment protection? I mean, part of, of, of a law working is actually how people perceive it. Is it, is it a, a legitimate law? Is it, is it an okay law? Uh, I mean, part, partly when people um, comply by law, they do so, of course, because they're afraid to perhaps be punished if they don't. But it's a very, very important reason why people comply is they actually believe that the law is right, 
right? So if you really want people to comply to your legal state, you need the legal state to be legitimate. Okay, and so this is what we set up to do. And we had manufacturing companies uh, that were all covered by collective agreements. So they were all okay in doing this kind of uh, deviations from the law. Uh, they, all, they were covered with different unions. So it's not just one type of union, it, it's multiple union types. Uh, I mean, we were sort of interested in the, how much there were differences in the unions and so on. They have between 20 and 80 em employees. Uh, and, and so it's important to understand that this whole study is based on the manager perspective. Emphasized here in red, so that you understand that, you know, we talk to, uh, we talk to the employers, basically. Um, and so to be included in, in the study, you have to have your own current experience. Uh, and so we try to find these types of people. We found 12, and so the green, the green text button over there says, we cannot claim, of course, for our results to be representative of manufacturing companies in Sweden, nor are they generalizable to the underlying population. But it, what they are, are very sort of informative cases of how employment protection works in practice in Sweden today. So we interviewed these managers, we transcribed these, all these interviews and coded them and tried to sort of sick, select out common elements in the stories told. Uh, we, we found four sort of main results that, we, that I'm gonna present to you today. The first one has to do with the relations to the unions. Uh, the unions are of course a major factor here in Sweden in particular. Uh, the second aspect is, is the legitimacy of employment protection in Sweden. Um, and then, of course, the stories themselves. So the managers having experienced redundancies due to lack of work, how did they figure this law to be working in practice? And managers having experience for redundancies of, due to personal reasons, how did they perceive that the law was working in practice? So. When, when it comes to the relations to the unions then, uh, we've, we thought that we would find more local clubs um, because union uh, memberships in Sweden is, is quite high still. I think it's average about 76% of, of the employees in the Swedish labor markets are covered uh, or are members of unions, I should say. Uh, but only one of these 12 companies in manufacturing actually had a local club uh, and, and so, the managers, of course, had experience from different organizations most of the time, and they had different opinions about what a local club's contribution meant for a company. Uh, different experience, but not, not at all negative, necessarily. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, that's, that's actually like a union that is based in the company, so that you organize in the company, you have like, oh, the members here, we. We have meetings on Thursdays and we negotiate locally with our managers when it's, you know, about it. It's like, uh, <coughs> yes. 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 So if it's a local union club, does that mean that those people are not members of some other union? No, they're members, they're just a club within the club structure, sort within of speaking. Within a bigger union? Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So it's just like a local organization. organization. Uh, so, but, but it wasn't very common uh, in these kinds of companies anyway. And even when there was a local club, uh, redundancies were always negotiated with central union negotiators. Uh, and, and the reason the managers told us was that it becomes really complicated when, when you have a local representative who then sits down and negotiates about their friends, basically. Uh, so when it's time for redundancies, you know, you call in someone from the central union and they do, of course, talking to the local representatives, but they actually sit down and, and you know, like this person needs to leave or that person needs to leave. Uh, what was striking, however, we found in these interviews 
uh, was the reports on how this quality of negotiations really depended on, on individuals. Uh, so we had this notion that it would be union dependent. You know, some unions are more radical, others are more, you know, consensus oriented or whatnot. But that didn't at all turn out to be what we found. We found instead that some individuals are more conflict oriented and some individuals are more like understanding of the employer perspective. So sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't is basically the outcome here. Uh, but however you think about this the, uh, negotiation and the quality of the relation with the unions, uh, it's clear from talking to these managers that they they consider it like a natural part of running a company in Sweden. They have mostly good relations, but sometimes, and especially when it comes to negotiations, they, they think that it's problematic that it's so dependent on who you get to talk to. Uh, and we see that in the interviews, they talk about like, yeah, we've been fighting so hard to keep our guy because he's so good. He understands business, he stands up for the employees, but he also understands what it means to run a competitive business. So, you know, they, they actually are very involved in, 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 in unions in some sense. Um, a second part then is, is how they perceive the legitimacy of employment protection. And, and we got, get to this by asking them actually, if you, were in, if you could decide, how would this law look? Would it be here? Would you do things? And it's clear that the, the, the idea or the principle employment protection uh, is quite legitimate in Sweden. Uh, the, all the employers basically say it's a needed piece of legislation. It, it's needed to create loyalty and trust. It, it's needed to protect employees from, from arbitrary treatments. So, in, so the idea of having some kind of a law in place is, is actually unproblematic. But there's always a but. So they start like, like, of course you can't treat people like shit. And, you know, like you, you need to take care of people and you need to avoid sort of these arbitrary treatments. <laughs> but, and then all kinds of but reasons come up. Uh, more flexibility is needed, especially when it comes to personal <laughs> reasons. But employers must be allowed to define what personal reasons is. But better rules would create a more forgiving and understanding labor market. So they, they think that the law, you know, is, is not working the way it should be working, basically. Um, and I have a quote here from one of the interviews, uh, Åke, who says, I don't think I would actually abolish laws, the law, but I would think quite long about how it looks today and what it costs and see if I can find solutions where it costs less overall. For some, it doesn't matter if it costs the companies, but it is after all the total cost that count. And I think it should be easier to terminate people. And it is easy to say, it should be easier to find new jobs. And, and, and this is a theme that's kind of occurring all, again and again, is that since it's so hard to get rid of people, uh, or to fire someone, the signal that you have been let go in the Swedish labor market makes other employers really hesitant to hire you. So, you know, that's that's sort of the gist of what, what is meant by a forgiving and understanding labor market. Uh, I'm not going to read this one to you. Um, but again, it's like, I think we need a more forgiving and understanding labor market where it's easier to change jobs, where it's okay to be unemployed, where it's okay to change industry, where it's okay to be 55 plus, and it's okay to come directly from high school or finish school and still feel like I have something to offer or I'm, I'm, I have competence. Uh, and so one of the unanticipated consequences that the employers point to here is that you don't really take risks in hiring people because, you know, if you, once they're hired, they're hired and it's very difficult to, to give them notice, to, to let them go if they, if they don't work for, for various reasons. So, you know, you become really risk averse and, you know, that makes it hard for people to find jobs. So when it comes then to the actual experience in working with the law, um, 
I have some quotes on, on redundancy due to work shortage. Last in, first out, the principle that seniority is what gives you um, priority in the labor market uh, versus competence, that is what you actually contribute to the, to the company. Uh, most of, of our employers uh, thinks that, that, first of all, it's, it's very unreasonable or, or too costly for companies to relocate or re, uh, to move people from, from senior people to a junior position and then train them. Uh, they have fewer positions. It's a very risky investment. They say, I have a guy that works really well today. So I'm going to let that guy go, and then I have to take this other guy, retrain him or her, and maybe it works, but maybe it doesn't. So I spent six months investing in, in developing the skills of this person, and then it's like, huh, you know, it doesn't work. So they think that is completely unreasonable for, for smaller companies. But they also find it most of the time very unreasonable to actually go for the last in, first out principles, uh, because when they sit down and downsize, they go on skills. Uh, I mean, this is so far from what the what I think the lawmaker thinks of in time um, of in terms of, of arbitrariness. Uh, I mean, you know, if you think of employment protection as something that should protect employees from, you know, arbitrary treatment. You know, skills are not arbitrary treatments. I mean, you know, we, we, you know, yeah. Anyway, so they, they think this is, you know, when I am downsizing, I'm trying to make my company competitive and survive in the long run. I want the dream team. I want to keep, you know, the people that I think is going to be like moving the company forward. Yes. So you said all of, all twelve had collective agreements. Yeah. And you said if you have a collective agreement, you, the employer, can negotiate, negotiate that and get rid of LIFO. <clears throat> yeah. So how many of the twelve negotiated getting rid of LIFO? Only one kept with a last in first out. Um, uh -huh. When they they got redundancies, not all twelve managers have on work redundancy some of them have experiences from personal reasons so it's not you know not not all of them have the same experiences so if, if 11 of the companies don't even have to deal with last in first out yeah. they're saying it would be unreasonable if we had to deal with it mm -hmm. well yeah so when it comes to like that as a principle, like a, a legitimacy, a legitimate principle of like doing stuff, they think that that this is not how you would want to go about doing a downsizing uh, process. Um, and we see that in the interviews, those people have negotiated with the unions that they are basically faced with two two routes, right? That are in in the green area here, you go with last in, first out, and you lose competence, right? And so they don't want to do that when, when the company's going badly. And or they don't go with last in, first out, uh, but then they have to pay. Uh, so they have to pay severance pays um, above the notice period that employees have the right to get. Yeah. So what percent of companies with collective agreements go with Last in, first out. That we have no information about in, in uh, Sweden, but we have suggestions saying that this is it. It's dwindling. I think last in, first out is just not part. That that is not the norm anymore. Uh, so the norm is basically that you pay up uh, to to renegotiate. And, and we're planning a, a follow-up study actually with companies who don't have collective agreements because they are they are obliged to follow the law. A little bit like extortion. Well, if you if you see the quote here, you can see um, that that Stefan, when he had made his redundancy calls, he basically say that you know. Well, you basically end up in court having to argue whether you could have, you know, relocated people to other positions and hence gone with the last in first out rules. And you don't want to do that. So 
Yes, the union used this as a clear means of pressure, generous terms, or we go, we go on with this. So they basically use the uh, negotiations to say this. Yeah. Um, in, in this kind of approach, you don't have a, good, um, a direct relation with the owner. Uh, it's really have been um, some big restrictions of Ericsson, uh, where you have uh, where, uh, where a more structured firm. Do you think the, you think the, the this experience you have here is valid also is valid also for the big firms? For the big firms, I think the big firms are much more likely to offer package deals to employees they want to make redundant and they have they have more I mean, so the same thing really. it's basically the same thing but but the there's less of a negotiation i think of course they negotiate but i think big companies also have they have labor lawyers they have hr specialists they have people who can you know put together a, a, a deal and negotiate with the unions in a much more sophisticated manner than, than these guys. There is a big difference with the Stockholm with a hot labor market yeah. and some, some regional um, or peripheric. Um, do you think there is a big difference in, in this case with the, the Stockholm experience and the um, peripheric experience? No, uh, I don't. I mean, I. Uh, we, I've, I've actually been to Malmö, yeah, various small places in, in Sweden, as well as in Stockholm, uh, interviewing. Um, and the, the experience is, is basically the same, I think. Um, it's, th this is the situation that these kinds of companies face. I mean, at least, I mean if you want to generalize somewhat, at, at least it doesn't seem to be regional difference differences in how, how these negotiations work, or we haven't found any. Um, so, yeah, so, so basically they, they, they choose to renegotiate the law um, to build up their dream team, uh, but they, are, they often find that it's, that it's very costly to do so. And of course, especially perhaps when, when there's a situation where there's actually, the firm is actually not doing very well. When it then comes to redundancies due to personal reasons, uh, that's a whole different ball game. What altogether? Um, we have four. We have categorized these in, into four uh, different um, personal reasons, uh, so to speak. Uh, we have mismanagement. We have negative behavior that affects work environment. We have violence, fear, and recklessness, um, which is, you know sometimes actually you know, crimes, uh, or we have lack of skills and bad performance or underperformance, really. Uh, and and in, all, in all these situations, we only find really uh, only that mismanagement uh, works as a, as a clear-cut example of where you can use the, the, the law to uh, make people redundant. Uh, and, and the... the um, Examples we have in our interviews is, is from abusive uh, people who use drugs or alcohol and are absent from work. And oftentimes it's been a process that has been going on for several years. And the unions, of course, in that case, they are very well aware of this problem. Uh, so, you know, you've had endless negotiations back and forth with the unions and you signed, you know, rehabilitation plans, you've invested in treatments and so on. And, and you know, when the employer finally says, like, I can't do this anymore, it's been four years, this person, you know, has been absent a year now, uh, you know, we're going to give him or her notice. And the, then the unions say, fine. When it comes to negative behavior that affects work environment, it's really hard to use objective grounds. Uh, so what we see here, the examples we have in our interviews are examples, for instance, um, uh, when there's a manager uh, in, the, in the firm uh, that creates an environment that other employees then comes to the boss and says, you know, do something, please. We, we, you, we can't have this person here. Uh, when it comes to violence, fear and recklessness, um, 
we also see that, that it's quite hard to use objective grounds uh, and unions seem to resist um, letting people go on these grounds and perhaps for the stigma it causes, right? So, you know, so here we, we often see that they cut deals, um, you know, six months and you resign voluntarily, shake hand and you're out of here. Uh, lack of skills and bad performance, it's really hard to use objective grounds again. And basically what employers end up doing or these managers end up doing is that they fake work organizational restructuring issues. Uh, they throw out old machinery and say, sorry, your work doesn't work, you know, isn't here anymore. Uh, and or they, they negotiate severance pay deals with the unions. Um, so basically what we find here is also that uh, part of, of what the managers do is that they actually give up. Uh, I don't know if it's seen there. Uh, and, and they tr sometimes try to negotiate something with the unions. The unions resist. They, they persist in saying, like, try something new. You know, it's not that bad, blah, blah. And sometimes in the end, the managers just say, I give up. I'm going to relocate this person to the place in the company where this where she or he makes the least problem for me. And I think that, yeah, yeah, we can talk more about this later. But, but so it really is obvious when you look at this, these results, when it comes to personal reasons, that this is not working at all in the Swedish labor market. You can't really use the law. And some of the uh, managers even say that personal reasons doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, we say, no, have you tried? Yes, I have tried. We have been negotiating, absolutely. It's just utopia. You can't get rid of someone based on personal ground, or at least, you know, at least it has been absolutely funny. And you've done according to all these rules. You know, there's a, there's a process here. You need to warn the employee several times before you can give him due notice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've done all, all of those things, but one of the employees is still here. We, we had to back down, it didn't work. And so this is one of the cases where managers are then, you know, keeping a person in the job that he doesn't actually, or she doesn't actually want to be there in the job. And so they do, this is basically the alternatives they have. You, you, you pretend that you have a reorganization that, that creates work shortage, you buy out employees or you really relocate them to somewhere where they don't do harm in a basement somewhere on, on you know, the second floor down to, where they you know, are for well, um, So I, I think I'm talking too much and so I'm going to skip the quotes, but we have some very nice, um, you know, quotes about that. Uh, and, and, but basically our, our conclusion here is that when it comes to personal reasons, the balance is perceived as extremely tilted. Uh, the burden of proof on the manager's side is just extreme. And, and the unions basically say, no, we don't, we don't see anything problematic here. Uh, even, and, and this is one of the paradoxical things is that even when it's their other members, their other union members who say like, we are afraid of this guy, you know, we, we, we dare not say anything because we are afraid that he's gonna, you know, hurt us when we go from work. Uh, even then the unions kind of resist using this um, part of the law. So going back to uh, anticipated and unanticipated consequences of, of this kind of legislation then, uh, what we have found is examples where, where it seems that the law is, is monetarized. Uh, you basically avoid using the law and pay to do so. Uh, seniority as a principle is, is, does not seem to be held up in practice. So this, you know, this is not how the law works. Uh, productivity, when, it, when we see costs that, it, and especially if we include costs that are also related to decreased job satisfaction and contagion effects, 
I mean, if you have someone you're afraid of in your workplace or you have a manager that, that you know, is, is horrible, you know, these costs um, are huge, especially in a small workplace when, when it's between 20 and 80 people who, who you know, hang out every day. Uh, so, you know, one person's negative behavior here is seen to affect everybody's workplace. And, and, and of course, that will have consequences on, on you know, productivity. Um, but then what, what I find, at least personally, is I, I do think that these moral unanticipated consequences are actually quite serious. Um, first, we have one of the discrepancies that we see is that when results from negotiations uh, clash with values, uh, and, and I have a particularly striking interview with a manager who, who tried to fire an employee who, who used violence on another employee. So basically he hit another person in the workplace and the employer said, you're out of here. I don't want to see you here ever again. And then he called the union and said, you know, this guy just hit another person. I want to fire him. And they said, no, no, it's, you know, due to stress. We don't really think it's that problematic, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then when he persisted, they said, uh, we're, then we're going to take this to court. And then he's, he's like, okay, how is this going to work? Like, I have to prepare a court case. Okay, the way, how long's the waiting list? Uh, one and a half years. Okay, so the guy that the guy struck, is he actually going to be a witness in this court case or is he just going to be like, I, I, I'm over this. So basically what he ends up doing is paying the guy who was hitting another person in the workplace nine months of extra pay uh, for not showing up to work. And he, he when, when we interviewed him, you could tell that he just felt that this was so morally wrong. Uh, he was so upset about having to have made that deal uh, because he, he felt like I wanted to show my employees that this is, you know, net, this is unacceptable behavior in a workplace. Uh, and so he had to sort of make this deal to just, you know, get along, you know, to do, to get somewhere. Uh, and he didn't want to wait one and a half years and spend resources, time, and energy reliving this case every day. So that that is one sort of moral consequence here. Basically, that it's it's just wrong. Uh, the other one is is these kind of legal uh, goals of non arbitrariness. Uh, remember, I, I said that the law is in place to to you know avoid sort of arbitrary behavior and we see that managers are learning to strategize around the law um, we have plenty of examples where you know they, they fake these work reorganizations uh, and they sit there of course negotiating with the unions and say oh we're so sorry but you know we have a work shortage now and you know and so it creates a lying culture you pretend that something is happening that isn't really happening. And I think that in itself is also a very damaging thing uh, for relations in the labor market when it's like strategizing and, you know, we're going to do this and then they're going to do that. And, and, and it's just, it's just not good morally, I think. Yeah. So we conclude that employment protection is an obvious norm. Uh, the, it, this, the, the idea that non arbitrariness uh, is, is, would be something that managers want is not true. They don't accept that as, as sort of a good behavior in the labor market. Uh, but the law itself, it gets really low ratings by managers. Uh, and it's really not seen as a legitimate law. It's seen as something that is really truly awful and doesn't work at all. Uh, the dream team trade-off, uh, it, that it makes it very much harder to deal with bad behavior in the workplace, uh, that you have these burdens of proofs and the long-term process you have to, and that it ends up creating a lot of, of immoral behavior if you want. Um, and then if you really want to talk about how this, is, is this protecting the employee, is it worth it? I mean, you can sort of say that, well, you know, it has all these unanticipated consequences, but maybe it's, you know, still kind of protecting employees. 
I'm not so sure. I mean, you know, this this type of fake, um, you know, seniority order thinking. I mean, it it it, it seems to me that you know you might be living under uh, some sort of fake notion that you're safe because you worked for for your employer for 20 years. But you know, when the redundancy comes, you're gonna you're gonna be renegotiated out of the workplace. So it, it's not sure that that's such a good thing. Uh, I think the hypocritical culture um, is is not really good for for employees either. Um, and and of course, in the end, what we have here are some really some examples of of, of bad behavior really paying off for people. And of, and, and of course, that you know not only undermines relations in the workplace, but it also, I think, undermines some of what the union's credibility is about. Um, you know, like if you hear about, you know, the guy that creates a bully situation at work and, and the union is protecting that guy, it's like, what? So I'm not worth, you know, like, he's, that, that's the guy they're going to protect? You know, we all hate this guy. Uh, so I think, you know, it has all kinds of interesting um, consequences also when it comes to employees. So, thank you. So, thanks a lot very much for your presentation. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and also, I think that um, her presentation made, made us think about the system in, in Italy and also make some comparisons. But uh, before also give you the opportunity to express your considerations and uh, maybe make some questions to, uh, to Charlotte, I would like just to uh, point out something because I recently read an article by um, Samuel Engrom, who is a researcher and a trade union official at Some CEO, yeah. <laughs> uh, representing white collar workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote about uh, employment security councils in uh, job security councils in, uh, in Sweden. So these bilateral bodies uh, created by trade unions and employees. I'm saying that to, to the other, but yeah. <laughs> I know that, you know. And uh, um, so these bilateral bodies established by trade unions and employer associations. In, uh, in different sectors also, and they are aimed at helping also with uh, um, economic uh, compensation, workers affected by these missiles, and also offering them support in finding new jobs and retraining them and, and so on. And basically his argument was that um, the establishment of these employment security councils that are very important in mm -hmm. Sweden yeah. uh, was made possible by the principle that you mentioned, uh, last in, for first out, and, and the same mandatory nature of, uh, of the employment legislation in, in Sweden. So the fact that, okay, we have a quite rigid principle, but also the possibility for collective bargaining to deviate from that, that principle. And thanks to uh, this possibility, um, employers that wanted to retain a more productive workforce um, were forced to bargain with, with trade unions, and trade unions said, yes, we can do that, but you have to give us something in, in return. And during these agreements, also, they had the chance to establish this kind of these employment security councils mm -hmm. in, in the so-called transition agreements. And uh, um, so my question is, do you agree with, uh, with that? Because um, as an external, I mean, while I, I was reading this article, I thought, okay, that's quite a good balance between a, a quite rigid legislation, but also the opportunity to deviate from, from it by collective bargaining, and also um, active labor market policies, so employment security councils that allow workers to find a new job and then to train themselves. But, I mean, from your presentation, I see another picture. So I just would mm -hmm. like to, to ask you what um, you think about that. I don't actually know about... Uh, the, these redundancy agencies uh, that you talk about, I mean, they they are a, a very, very unknown aspect of, of the Swedish welfare state because it's actually not the welfare state. Uh, it's actually like private organizations that, 
that are set up by the unions and the employer organizations to help people who, who work for various reasons have, have uh, lost their jobs. Um, and uh, so, yes, so they take care of the people who are, are let go and retrain them or, or help them write CVs or whatever they need to, to actually move on. Um, I don't really know how important the, uh, the law was for setting up those institutions. Um, and, and I guess I would think that, I mean, if you really want to say that you, that the law created something that they were negotiating, I would, I would think it would be the other way around that, you know, you have the strict employment law. So why would you, they already have notices and, you know, long leave pace. Um, but I guess, so you're basically saying that the unions were, were be able to, I don't, I don't know the article by uh, anyone, Yes, but, the article, but, yes, they said that um, given the fact that the unions have the chance to, um, to agree with, uh, um, I mean, have the chance to bargain with the, the employers uh, over uh, this issue, over also the uh, possibility of deviation from, from this principle, employers associations and I trade see. unions try to um, to establish employment security councils and uh, while saying that, okay, we give employers the opportunity to retain the more productive workforce, but we also ask uh, them to contribute by paying because uh -huh, also uh, employment security councils are, are financed by contributions paid by employers and, and, and yes. employees. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so in the end, okay, you can, you can fire whoever you want, but we established something that is again a safeguard for, uh, for I see. Well, I, I, the way it seems to have worked out then is that they got their cookie and get to eat, <laughs> eat it too. Uh, because I think that what comes up really strongly in your, our interviews is the, is the norm that if you deviate, you pay. Uh, it's, it's really not the case that, that, you know, oh yeah, it's fine to deviate because we have the redundancy agencies. Uh, so they've sort of paid twice then for, also, for being... You research like, on, on small enterprises. I think that uh, maybe for large enterprises, it's, it's easier to have the chance also to, to pay, to give money for... Oh, uh, sure. Uh, for I mean, the richer. Uh, it's also easier for them to relocate uh, because they have more positions to play with. But, but yeah, so, yeah, of course. Um, we were interested in the smaller or smallish. I mean, they're not really super small, but we were interested in these companies because of, of having both kind of a close relation to employees. Uh, it's not like you sit on the HR department in er Ericsson and you have like, oh yeah, these are like 500 people and I need to get rid of 25. It's like, I don't care, <laughs> you know, they're not really individuals to me, but, and, and so it's like, it's, a, it's kind of a nice, um, setting for uh, for understanding uh, what happens and then the interaction between laws and, and management and, and so on i think okay. maybe someone else want oh. yeah i will after having done this is of course you have interviewed one of the components the employers, not the employees. What is your conclusion? Would it be better, you think, to go more to the US uh -huh. style of uh, market, some market rela it's a relationship with, with some uh, Friday afternoon, you said, oh, thank you. <laughs> you need not show up on Monday. You will not show up on Monday, or do you think um, you should, uh, one should move in some other way in respect of what you have? Yeah, um, I'm, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, uh, and so I, I'm, I don't know how to write legal text, uh, but it seems to me, I mean, just from sort of a practical, um, you know, sweet perspective, uh, that the law perhaps was a mistake. I mean, 
before 1974, when the law was was perhaps a mistake. Uh, before 1974, employment protection was covered in collective agreements in Sweden. Uh, so, you know, the, the workers, the unions and the employers actually had clauses in collective agreements about what was arbitrary and, and objective and how you should do things and leaves, you know, notice periods, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, uh, I think perhaps that is more in line with the Swedish model. Uh, I mean, if you really want to believe that state intervention should be kept at a minimum and the Swedish unions and the Swedish Employer Federation should deal with issues in the labor market, uh, maybe the law shouldn't have been there. Um, and, and it would be like, okay, it's up to you guys, you know. Maybe with, you know, we have a court. It's not like you don't, can't resolve issues of, of arbitrariness. Um, and before, before they had a mediation institute that where, they, where the unions and the employers took issues of, of, of these kinds and negotiated. Like, was this, is this an okay, is, was this personal reason enough? Um, and if, if that seems far-fetched to, to sort of abolish it, I think it is. I mean, it's completely unrealistic, I think, uh, today. I would say that you should perhaps at least leave it very open uh, for the negotiating parties to define what is arbitrary. Uh, so that, I mean, in today's situation, when you have this writing of the, this should be in this order and, and you know, that, that, da, uh, um, it, it, it seems very unpractical and it doesn't really work well. Uh, and, and when it comes to personal reasons, it just seems that that has become interpreted to be too burdensome, too much in, in the balance of, of protecting the employee, I think. So, you know, something, yeah. I don't think, I, I mean, my vision is not at all to have like a, and I don't think the employers, the managers we interview want foresees that either or wants that. I mean, you know, they describe, wants to be able to just like fire someone. Um, I, just, I, I think it's not part of the Swedish culture uh, to, to treat people like that at all. Uh, and I, so I, I do think that, you know, no, we do not want a, a US model. It shouldn't work, it wouldn't work in Sweden. And, and then, and in Italy, you very often go to court. Mm -hmm. Do you use the, the court to decide on labor um, conflicts? And in this study, you have made, how, how, were there many cases in which this went to court? Or no, no, no. They, no. Were, they were managed uh, on, a, let's say, on a, on a on the basis internal of the of the, the firm or with the help of uh, the central um, labor yeah. uh, organizations. They they uh, when it becomes tricky, uh, which it sometimes does, especially around personal reasons. Uh, the managers call. I mean, since they're covered with collective agreements, they're members of an employer organization, and so they call they call their guy. You know, the unions call their guy, and the other and then. These guys come out, come out, and they are they are of course lawyers, or you know legally trained, and so you know you bring your guy and I bring my guy, and then they talk and and, and they take over basically. Uh, but it, none of the cases that we have went to court. Uh, it's seen as extremely costly to 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 do so. Um, one of, one of the reasons why they go to court in Italy is that because there is a tradition in the labor courts to give reason to the worker uh -huh. rather than to the company. See? That's see. why they decide to go off. I see. Uh, you know, otherwise the process is the same. Mm -hmm. You discuss the representatives of the employers and yeah. the representatives of the union. They discuss together to decide the number of people you want to get rid of or whatever. Yeah. I went to this experience, that's why. Yeah. But I don't tell you how to solve it because it's not really uh, morally, morally, let's say, justifiable. Because we went to discuss with the 
and very quiet. We decided to reduce the number of personnel because we out, um, outsourced some of the services yeah. we did. Other, other companies, outside companies. So we went from 36 employees to 15. Because uh -huh. I forgot to say, in Italy there is this law which is called stage of workers since the 70s where a company was less than 15 employees is exempted from these procedures. Uh -huh. Okay, we have so, time. Uh, as long as you have more than 15, you are obliged to follow these uh -huh. procedures. Uh -huh. So we went and we followed these procedures. Mm -hmm. We started to discuss, and after one full day of discussion, at one o'clock in the morning, wow. oh, that's, that's usually the, uh -huh. that's the standard, our lawyer, got together with the union representative and he said, I've solved problems if you're ready to pay something. Uh -huh. Of course I am. Uh -huh. So with very little money, he pays some sum to the union representative. Oh, not to the employees. Not to the, uh -huh. the union representative. I see. Yeah, they, they I see. Well, that's a different that's a different culture from the Swedish culture, yeah. what you work no, with. We have also some different uh, between individual dismissals and collective Yeah, yeah. 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 In, in, well, that's in case similar. of collective yeah. dismissals, we have also some broader criteria established by the law, but that can be revised by collective agreements. Mm -hmm. and, and the law just says, says um, seniority criteria and uh, uh, company needs. Uh, Obviously, and also uh, the, the fact that the employer should consider also workers that have some family burdens, or the uh -huh. fact that they uh -huh. have to take care of children okay. or relatives, and, and so on. And then we have, yes, a separate um, case for uh, individual uh -huh. cases of individual uh -huh. dismissals, yeah. and and then uh, and then within individual dismissals uh, for subjective. Reasons, so personal yeah. reasons, and for objective economic uh, mm -hmm. economic mm -hmm. reasons, and and there I think that the because the higher cost for the employer comes from um, the possibility that the dismissal is declared unlawful uh -huh. by by the court. So when the court declares a dismissal as unlawful, the employer has to pay something also from 2015, 2014, the Jobs Act reform uh, established quite prefix, predetermined a compensation payment mm -hmm. for the employee affected by an unlawful business. I see. So uh, the employer is, is obliged to pay something in, in this case. It doesn't pay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. I wanted to ask to the relation between the employment protection and the unemployment protection, because I think part of the debate is not only how much or strongly one should be protected from unemployment, but to bear the cost. Mm. Because at the end, we can see that in many cases, there is at the end of the game a dismissal, so we're speaking of people who are practically unemployed, they cannot stick to the company. So I assume that in Sweden there is unemployment uh, protection subsidy or so on. Uh, so there's not a push to, uh, to leave to the society as a whole to pay the price of those who are practically assuming that one works is one who produces an income, not some one who receives an income from the company. So to officialize those who are that and the, and the, the society as a whole to unemployment benefits uh, mm. pays the price and not to oblige the company uh, yeah, no, we have what's called a Ghent system, uh, where where the uh, empl unemployment um, insurance is is managed by unions. So if you're a member of a union, you're often also a member of, of an unemployment um, unemployment organization insurance. I don't know what you call them, uh, but they're their protection. Yeah. So if you lose your job, you will get unemployment benefits. That's partly paid by the unions uh, as an insurance for their members, but partly also by the state. So the state subsidizes the um, the unemployment um, insurance with money. But but it's related to union 
or you it's it's you make an active choice to be part of a, a an unemployment um, agency protection. So it's not the, the, when once you're out of your job, the the company does not pay for you in any manner. I mean, except for the no, notice period, which is which ranges between one month and six months, depending on how long you worked for a company. And the notice period was on top of the unemployment benefits that you have. So if you're not unionized, you don't get any unemployment benefits. You're not entitled. To no, any we don't. So. If, I mean, you can no. That's not true. You can be. You can choose to be not a member of the union, but still be a member of the unemployment insurance. So it's standard insurance. You have to pay. So it's a. It, but it's really. So it, it depends it, on how much you pay. Yeah. So. No, no, no. It's a. It's a fixed sum uh, to be, and it, and the sum depends on how how oft, how much unemployment is in your sector of the economy. So sometimes it's quite high the pre, the fee, and sometimes it's very low. So. It matters. Um, so suppose suppose um, I'm a man at a, a, a farm and I have 50 employees. Can I just say I don't want to let my workers be unionized? So I just can't operate. No, you can't. I mean, you cannot say that you don't want your employees to be unionized i mean it's up to them i mean it's a it's considered like a human right to to be part of a union and, and that so if my 50 employees don't want to be in a union i can avoid all this mess no then the law is, is what then, see, then see that's the boss. trick yeah so it, yeah. only firms that are covered by so, collective agreements so can law strives companies I mean, you could imagine that an employer saying to his union, could, could he say to his uh, prospective employees, he can't say no. no. So that's not legal. No. So the whole thing drives people into collective agreements. The loss does. Well, it, it makes it perhaps more beneficial for employers to be part of, of a collective, collective agreement, agreement because they then they can negotiate can, these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, so I, I that's, system, well, it's, it's, but you say the um, money, the money goes to the union worker, not to the union bosses. Yeah. So that, that raises the issue of what is the, what are the incentives of the union bosses to be so difficult towards employers? I think it, the incentives is partly, I mean, it's, it, not all of them are, uh, but, but, Many of them are. Um, and why are the ones who are difficult, difficult? Just because they can? Just because they, I think they have a strong hand in negotiations. I know. Um, and said they like to exercise power and be jerks. Well, Super you know, they can also, I mean, you know, they can, you can also think of it as, as being a union. You show that you can so negotiate can well for your members, yeah. right? So you, you, you strike a good deal and, and you know, you, I think that also members ask the union to, to protect themselves. Sure. So sometimes it's, it's also a matter of a culture of mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and also maybe also workers prefer to maintain their job instead of search for uh, for another one, even though maybe they don't like or sure. or. Uh, and, but, uh, yeah. And maybe for this reason, I was thinking that another way to tackle the issue could be training programs for both the negotiating parties mm -hmm. for union representatives and, and for managers, helping them uh, find a sustainable solution without all these uh, um, tension. Yes. So is your work directed largely at persuading the union people that they're not doing good by keeping the levels of toughness that they keep? I think you my. Know, so in other words, if you think how tough they should be, some protection, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, but yeah. some is like, well, this level of protection actually creates all these problems, makes Sweden poor, mm -hmm. makes employers not want to hire people, and so if you guys could bring it down, everyone will be better off. Yeah. So you just want to persuade. I just them. see my motivation for actually getting into this line of research was that. You know, you, he, you you sort of hear these abstract notions of why employment protection is bad 
for 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 a country for and for companies. Uh, but when you actually listen to um, polls of employers in Sweden and and they say like labor law is the the worst thing, uh, it's said with a passion and hatred that I just found found like. You know, we have laws saying you can take leave of absence when you have children for 10, you know, like for as long as you want to, you can work part time. I mean, why is employment protection so hated? I mean, there's all kinds of productivity reducing legislation in place. You know, why do they hate? Why do they hate this one so much? And I think partly the, the answer is because it cuts into the right to lead and manage your firm. I mean, it's 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 part of like i own this place i want to run it the way i like it and 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 so i think it cuts into that notion of like ownership but i also think that a, a part of it is the moral issues that they actually feel like this is this is this is insane this is no one thinks this is right uh, no one thinks that a person should be allowed to hit another person in the workplace and then get nine months free free work space. Uh, I mean, it's it's just wrong. And I, so I think part of, of my interest in the issue was to sort of tell these stories to actually understand better why is it so why is it so upsetting um, to work with this law. And I think that. These stories need to be heard, um, just to. I suppose yeah. that the other things like child leave, you know, parental leave, and um, like there's less of these fuzzy criteria and manipulations sure. yeah. to them, so they don't degrade the relationships and yeah. culture as mm -hmm. much as this fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy one does. Mm -hmm. Maybe just one last yes. uh, Why? Because you said that before 1974 this was not a uh, case, so criteria were established by collective agreements. So why uh, the government decided to, uh, to have a say in this? In this, in this that, oh, that is, of course, a debated issue. Uh, and um, so I, 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 um, I read a Nukander that I am uh, actually citing wrote about this period in in, uh, uh, in the labor market, and it's it's a, a new young Olof Palme, which was the leader of the Social Democrat Party in Sweden. Uh, he wanted to make you know perhaps make a stand, and and uh, uh, and partly it's he at least Nukander argues that it was actually like the Liberal Party came into government ha having all these like work related and, and labor market reforms that they suggested to government all the time. And so I think the social Democrats wanted to also show that we are the ones who are, you know, doing the labor market stuff here. And so, you know, he, it was an ambitious kind of like, oh, we're going to do things right. And we're going to make the labor market more just and, you know, protect people. And, and of course, in, 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 in some ways, it's hard not to see this as, as sort of tilting the balance more to the unions. Uh, so instead of like having negotiations without legal boundaries, they were now saying like, and here's here's a gift to the unions so they can use this as, as, as a help. Uh, in Italy, after the same four years before, I mean, there was also a historical moment in the 70s. Mm. Uh, the, the unions as a, as a yeah. It was a special period in Swedish politics. I mean, we had the union, the sort of wage earners funds that were, you know, going to buy up company stocks. And I mean, it was a very specific climate, I think, um, that is hard to understand today, perhaps. But, but um, yeah. It was a special period everywhere. You know, the difference yeah. is yeah. when did it end? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, not, not at the same time in, you know, in different countries, yeah. Exactly. They're going on. Yeah. Scientists, they were shooting the idea. Forget that. In, in Sweden, it ended the start in the beginning of the 80s with the social democrats. Yeah. With, uh, the, the, what is it? Yeah. With uh, 
more liberal uh, economy. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it starts with the social democrats and it ends with it. Was, <laughs> it, it was going back. <laughs> and it is interesting. I mean, now we have a social democrat government, and now they're talking about reforming laws, uh, right. basically in liberalizing laws. Uh, so again, it's like the social democrats are actually like liberalizing, perhaps. But they're not the impetus, perhaps. They are not, uh, but but um, they have decided. You know, when when you look at the rhetoric today uh, in relation to laws, they 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 are saying like, oh, it has some problems. Uh, so you know, they. Uh, I'm gonna get on Swedish TV and give give all those Swedes a good talking to. <laughs> if I am no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't intend to. And what is? Uh, are you telling me a new, a new, a new study of research? Yeah. So we have we have actually applied for research funding uh, to continue uh, making interviews, and we we are happy to be actually working with the redundancy agencies uh, in in Sweden. So we're hoping to also in, uh, interview employees who have been let go uh, in order to sort of have the, because it started raising a lot of questions about like how do how is this perceived by the people who are negotiated out and, and given deals and, and so on I, I mean is it you know we, we asked the managers and they said um, sort of anonymously or all of them I don't know uh, they said no it was not controversial because that, of course, was our, was controversial to change the order or, or negotiate deals so that you know long senior people were let go, and they were like, no, not at all. Everybody knew that you know these were the people who should go, uh, and so that that everybody knew would be interesting, I think, to to follow up on and, and interview employees. Well, it would be interesting to, to do also a comparison study between the Swedish legislation and other legislation. Oh, sure, yeah. Other countries. Yeah. Perhaps we will have to decide whether the law will be fair or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So I'm just curious, so what about an employee? Would it be illegal for someone to put on their veto? I promise, whoever wants to employ me, I promise I will never <laughs> Go try to be a you try to be unionized. So in other words, if the if the communication came from the employees, yeah, that would be legal. Yeah, I mean, and so then that would not be binding. It would no, of be course binding, not. But it would still yeah. be a verbal. It still sure. needs to be a CV. You know. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, but still, I think it could be meaningful. People on a server. Like I don't. I mean, I. You, you think that, that managers perceive unions as a problem. They most of the time don't. I mean, it, this is very particular when it, when it comes to this issue with, with, uh, with the late, uh, employment protection. Uh, I mean, when we talk to, when we talk to managers, uh, they, they are like, I wish I had a local union. I wish I had someone to talk to about, you know, these matters that were sort of negotiating with me about, you know, the next step in, in company development. Uh, and, and the guy who, who does have a local club in our, in our material, the only one, he said like, I wish they were more active. <laughs> I wish they were like, you know, not only interested when it became when we negotiate wages. I wish they had came with ideas or, you know, like, yeah. He wants to talk to them because he's got a deal with, with being part of the whole collective agreement and unionized labor um, entails. So if you could hire 50 people who had on their Vita, I promise not to want to join a union, he wouldn't need to have those people helping him. You know, he wouldn't have those problems to deal Well, with. I think so still you. He wouldn't have his yeah. job. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. I mean, if he's a manager, if he's a manager who does relations with unions. No, in the, all all our managers are involved in. It's not their job to negotiate. I mean, they're 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 running yeah, the business. Yeah, yeah, they're too small to have. Okay. That's part of the charm of these guys. All right. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you so much. <laughs> It was my first 
outside of Sweden presentation, so <laughs> we're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I hope it makes sense. Basically, yes. yeah.